If yep. you haven't done an ultra before, what's your advice in terms of getting into it? Because there is a variety of different events. The big gripe I actually have with people looking to get into it for the first time is that they look for an event. Mm -hmm. Like you don't need an event. Make an event yourself. Like if you want to basically go map out somewhere that you've never been before or find a route that someone's done. There's a million of them around on bikepacking.com or you go steal one off my Strava or off my ride with GPS for the Otways. Like I've got a million routes there. In today's episode, we are joined by Dr. Stephen Lane and we are talking all things bikepacking and ultra endurance racing. Stephen has won multiple national titles spanning across road, time trialing and gravel and now is rising quickly in the ranks of the ultra endurance scene. We draw on his knowledge to explore how to get into this discipline of cycling, including training, equipment and racing. All right, welcome to the Alt Route Podcast, uh, Mr. Lane. I'm pretty excited to have you on, I must admit. Your, I guess, foray into ultra endurance bikepacking, I won't say racing because I know you don't like calling it racing, I'll just say events. Uh, it's always a race. Once a racer, always a racer. As somewhat, I must admit, inspired me and my gravel racing, and I think maybe following somewhat of a similar trajectory, both gotten, well, do time trials and road racing and then ventured into gravel, and now you're more commonly probably doing the ultra stuff, which is an area that I haven't gone into yet, but one that I'm eyeing off and thankfully have you to give some great advice and help into what that's going to look like. Yeah, well, well, firstly, thanks for having me. And secondly, ultra is not that scary once you've done a couple of them. It's just a bike ride, just a bit longer. Well, it's certainly an interesting space and one that I want to dig into a little bit deeper in the episode. But what I do want to start off with, because I think it's actually quite a funny story, is how you got into cycling. Usually they're pretty generic, like in somewhat, you did wear a triathlete, which went into cycling, which is kind of common. But the reason why you started cycling is actually quite funny. Yeah, the triathlon was step two. The first step was me living in a country town back in Colac and going to uni in Melbourne and had a VL Commodore that went pretty fast and I used to drive it too fast and ended up losing all my points on my license every time I drove back for the weekend back to the country and had to give my license up for a while and that forced me to buy a push bike to get around and I bought a little Trek bike and that was it really. I think mum said, oh, there's a duathlon on down in Melbourne. You should go jump in that. I was like, oh, yeah, I was always a pretty good runner and I've been riding and I got up to the start line and got my ass handed to me and was like, yeah, okay, how come these guys go so fast? What do they do? And kind of just fell into it from there. Sports science and everything is kind of what I fell in love with and here I am now. Yeah, it's a pretty cool way to fall into a sport and one that's, I would say, obviously a big part of your life now, not only your enjoyment for events, but the fact you're a coach as well. Yep. So, yeah, it's just funny how we fall into these things, I suppose. Yeah, it's definitely no longer a hobby. It's kind of everything revolves around bikes, on me on bikes and other people on bikes. You've There's a lot that I'd love to cover, but I'm, well, we can't really do a five-hour podcast, but there's you've obviously got a number of studies that you've done, which is super interesting in terms of train low, caffeine, your coaching and the incredible athletes that you've worked with. But I specifically want to talk about bikepacking because I think we'll easily cover a fair chunk of time today. Yep. What I am interested in is that there's no doubt that gravel is progressing quickly as a discipline. Ultras have always been around, but I think you could probably say they're growing a fair bit as well with, with gravel, I think, that that's coming into it. But I want to know how you made your transition from being TT road-based, and I know you were a triathlete before that, but what yeah. sparked, why ultras? Like it's a, There's a pretty diverse from being a national I, I, champ to yeah, now well, doing this. Yeah, I did road for years. I don't know. It was just a natural progression. I think I'm 43 now. I think as you get older, you, you turn up to a lot of these events and there's there's no spring chickens there usually. They're usually older, mature riders. But, yeah, like I was just kind of – I started off with like the longest ride I'd ever done was three peaks and I was an eight-hour wave leader. And what's that? 230 Ks. The first time I did that, I was – scared shitless of that distance and then i did a 300k gravel one and went oh that was 15 hours i was like oh i got tired but i wasn't dead at the end like you kind of just hit this point of nearly starting to feel good again after a certain period of time and then i don't know when the overnighter was then it was vic divide and that turned into a two-day ride like riding through the night and then 
you sort of stop getting scared of that and you're like, all right, well, let's do something a bit longer. And I think the long, long stuff still scares me, like something like Tour Divide in the US where they're doing two weeks straight of 300 plus K a day is still, I guess, unexplored for me. And I've failed a couple of them trying to do something that long. And I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And it's not physical, it's mental at that point. So yeah, I guess the transition was also like, I don't know, road racing was, there's so, I used to just not, I'm not so much nervous, but just you put so much effort into a time trial or a road race and the road races these days are getting shorter and shorter. So you drive three hours to a race and it's only 60 Ks long. I'm like, this is a waste of a weekend. So that's probably why I've started like doing the longer gravel stuff because it feels like you get more bang for your buck. And things just don't go wrong because, you know, a group rides away up the road in the first 10Ks and you're like, well, there's my race over. So these big long ones, you have more time to think, you have more time to enjoy it, basically. Even if you're hurting, you're still kind of enjoying it. I guess you've got to learn to enjoy it. But yeah, I guess I sort of fell in love with the simplicity of it, really. You're not in the red hurting. You know, you're not getting dropped sort of thing because someone's going hard. You're getting distance because you're stopping more or you're, you know, just not dealing with the, the situation as well as someone else. I like that, that you referenced a road race and not getting dropped when you were doing that to a lot of people most of the time in, <laughs> in your racing. Well, I, I, I only ever remember the bad times when I'm getting dropped. I don't remember riding away. I kind of remember the negatives, sadly. And I can name a lot of times I've been like, oh, just I needed to hang on for a bit longer. But you know, it's, these days, I, I don't know, it's not about ultra is just different i guess it's still hard at the start it can be but it just settles down yeah and one of the things you referenced there and i I like it and i've spoken about it before i think i'd put in like an enormous three-month block in for nationals dropped a chain I don't know, four laps in and probably would have been dropped anyway, irrespective because it's an incredibly hard race, but doesn't almost feel like there's reward for effort putting like that you put in for it. Whereas the longer that you do these events, they become and peaks is almost like that as well. It's it's a challenge, not necessarily about the result, and therefore it's you versus you, which I know you've referenced that before as well. Is that something that you think one you find appealing, but other people find about these ultra events? Yeah, it's definitely, it's a journey. It's not the end point. Like you you go to an ultra and you get to the end point, it might be two in the morning and you're standing underneath the clock tower taking a photo of yourself to show what time you got to the end and there's no one else there. It's like, yeah, we'll be, this is great fun. So it's not like you're doing a victory salute as you cross the finish line. It's about the adventure of doing something that scares you. And I think a lot of us these days in modern society, we're wrapped in cotton wool with everything we do. We're in warm houses. We avoid the bad weather. We've got great clothes that keep us warm outside. It's um, going out and doing something scary. You get home and you feel rejuvenated from it, whether it's serotonin or dopamine sort of increases. But you come home feeling like you've actually, you know, I guess you feel like you're alive, I guess. You go through the peaks and troughs of the highs feeling good and the lows of lows and to appreciate, like, I guess, the, the medium of that, like your daily life. You've got to experience what being scared and cold feels like in the middle of the night and tired and then you kind of appreciate the good and the mediocre a lot more not that every ride's like that like i'm not saying they're all bad but they they can they can be yeah no i get what you're saying now you kind of brushed over your progression of races a bit i know you did the jam for jamison which you referenced i think took about 15 hours that's about a 300k gravel race Yep. Audax event. With a lot um, of climbing, yeah. Yeah, a hell of a lot of climbing. And then I'm pretty sure from there, did you jump straight into a Vic Divide? Yeah, I think Vic Divide was not soon after. It might have been a year or two after that, I think. The Vic Divide was 650Ks, 12,000 metres of climbing from Melbourne up to Albury. And that was that was definitely the first one where I was, you know, pretty – I think I went into it pretty naive, actually, because I'd never actually ridden through the night. But – me being me, I kind of went and scouted all the course and knew the sections and did a lot of, like I just finished dinner at night time sometimes and just go, all right, I'm going to go ride five hours until 2 a.m. in the morning and I live in the Otway, so I'm kind of out in the middle of nowhere and it just gets you used to, you know, riding into the night, dealing with what happens when you get tired and stuff. So, yeah, look, it was a great experience, to be honest. There was that event, there's a couple of sections in it. You're sort of probably about 12 hours in maybe when you get to Jamison and you 
you've got to go up the Howqua track, like that scares a lot of people. They seem to think it's a really sketchy piece of track and it takes eight hours or so to get up it, up the top of Mount Buller. And like I didn't have that fear at all. I was looking forward to it because I knew it was such a nice night and the track was nice and I was going to have it all to myself. And yeah, I just sort of charged on and sort of, yeah, there was no fear there. I don't really have a fear of riding through the night. I never have, whereas I know some of the athletes I coach do have the fear of going through the night. Then you sort of do it for the first time and sometimes it's like, yeah, it's it's like you're in a different world. Like it's it's actually quite an amazing experience if it's uh if the weather's nice. Yeah. No, it's I recommend it to everybody. Get out and go do a night ride. So you you also did that in just over thirty eight hours, which was a course record on your first attempt. Yeah. Which is pretty phenomenal. I wanna know, do you think it was a benefit going into it, as you say, somewhat naive in the fact that you kind of wrote it almost like you only know how, whether now that you've got a bit more experience under your belt in ultras, whether you'd still ride the same way? Oh, I'd still use, like, it's all about the stopping strategy, really. Like, if I did it again, I reckon I could knock a bit of chunk, I reckon I could knock a bit of time off that, off that time, just knowing how hard I can push on sections now, whereas earlier it was my first long race, I probably was a bit more conservative, but... Yeah, I don't think I'd write it any differently. Like equipment choices now, like as you get more experienced, you tend to not bring some items with you that you kind of think you might need. And, I, you know, weather dependent now, I'd probably just bring me and enough water and food, whereas before I had, you know, an emergency bivy and bits and pieces. So, you know, you start to run a lighter setup the more accustomed you are with knowing what it's like and that's you've got to be smart and educated as well about what the weather's going to be like at the top of the mountain it's silly going up there if you haven't checked the weather to go oh yeah it's only going to be 10 degrees i'll survive if it's going to snow you might be in strife but yeah there's a lot of effort going into these events which is why some of the organizers kind of have a bit of a a selection criteria to sort of say hey are you prepared for this because some people see and go oh this looks great i want to do it and they go out and do it and they're, they're like oh there's always a Facebook thread about the event and someone saying, oh, could I ride my ride bike, road bike on this? <laughs> People are just like, no, mate, like don't even come, please, because you're going to get stuck out somewhere. So it is about being prepared as much as it is, you know, being physically fit. you got to be prepare yourself mentally for the course and know what's coming up. That is a question that I did have to ask you, and we will go into a little bit more detail about it. But obviously, being physically fit and doing the training for it is obviously a big part of it. But as you said, there's a whole other part that's almost no matter how fit you are, it's irrelevant if you don't have the right gear, expertise and experience. Yeah, like well, equipment comes down to, and again, we're going to go over this. I think you mentioned it at the start. Like I don't like to call these things. For for 99% of the field, these ultras aren't a race. It's There's only a couple of people there who are going, I want to get to the end as fast as I can. Whether their goal is to beat the fastest known time over that course or whether there's a couple of people who are at a similar level that are really racing to the end under those conditions of that year, like we see at Tour Divide each year. There's always just a couple of people out the front where the rest of them might be days behind. So for the ones days behind, like I wouldn't skimp on equipment. I'd bring everything you need with you to have a more enjoyable time. So yeah, equipment choice comes down to what your approach is to the event. And most of the time you can get away with being overbiked. So you're more comfortable and have more, you know, more equipment on the bike, more warm clothes, just in case something does go wrong. Because I'm sure one day it's going to happen to me where I'm stuck out somewhere with minimal stuff and go, yeah, I wish I had to bought more stuff with me now that's all gone pear shaped. We'll talk about the equipment a little bit more in detail after going into training. It's just an area that I'm kind of fascinated by and especially given you're a coach as well. Yep. How your training has changed from a few years ago when you're road TT orientated to now in this ultra endurance space? I wouldn't say it's changed a great deal, to be honest. It's like I still do the, like I've never been a sprinter type person. I've never done a stack of VO2 max type efforts. I've always just done a TT, a hill climber kind of strategy where I just do a stack of FTP work and a stack of 90% efforts. And that's kind of what I've always done. And I think 20 20 years of that has kind of made me what I am now. If I'm racing, as I get older, I've found it harder to do more high intensity. So anything over threshold, like I'll do a day where I try to do some hard efforts, VO2 stuff. The next day I am pretty cooked and I can't really do much. So I've just kind of gravitated towards just more 
moderate 90% FTP work more often these days. And most rides I do, I'm riding up a hill at 90%. It's kind of just the, the training approach I take. I guess for the ultras, you just want to customize yourself with going longer than normal. So, you know, if you're going to go do a 40 hour race, you think it's going to take two days, you might end up having a sleep in between during the night. You don't go out and do a 40 hour training ride to get ready for it. Yeah. The longest training ride I'd ever probably do would be maybe 10 or 12 hours, which is really just me going for a ride all day. You stop somewhere for lunch and then you, you keep going. So it's, it's nothing hard in it. You come home usually feeling not cooked. You know, maybe the first time you do it, you feel cooked, but as long as you eat well and hydrate well and ride at the appropriate pace, you usually can back it up. And as you get better at it, you start linking them together. So you do, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, you might go try and do eight hours back to back. That's usually my approach is where I stack them together. So I'll try and do a few long days back to back. It might be a, you know, a six, four days in a row, six hours, four days in a row. By the fourth day, sometimes you're tired. Other days you're actually like, well, I'm feeling better on the fourth day than it was on the first day. And that's when you know you're pretty much ready to go for a, for an event. The problem is though, that's me and I've got all the time on my hands in the world to go ride a bike. But when I've got an athlete that's working full time and has kids and they say, look, I've only got 12 hours a week to train. Uh, the wife said I can have, you know, a little bit more time on the weekends because I've said I want to do this big long event. You know, I can go ride as much as I want on the weekends. Then my job is to figure out how to optimize that time and it's basically the same you stack their weekend long rides back to back which a lot of people if they went long on a saturday they wouldn't go long on a sunday and it's just something i think you got to try and get used to doing is doing back to back rides so that the second ride your first hour you're like oh legs are pretty crap but then after that they actually come good and you get a bit of confidence that that you start to learn ultra where you go through these waves of ups and downs as the event goes on you mentioned the sleep low stuff that i did and for everyone listening sleep low is sleeping with low muscle glycogen which is which was one of my projects from a phd which is where you do basically two sessions in a day so the sleep well that's actually train low but sleep low would be you get home from work at night you do a hard training session as long as you can stand for a really hard interval session then you go to bed without eating you might have you do have dinner before the session so when you ride then you sleep through the night with low muscle glycogen and of course that's basically what happens in an ultra you end up after eight hours riding with not much muscle glycogen in the legs and it's just trying to figure out training strategies to get yourself into that situation where you're riding with low muscle glycogen. And I think the brain starts to learn that, oh, I can still keep going because it is monitoring that level. And you're, you know, as a negative feedback saying, hey, don't go too hard. We're running on empty here. So you get better at doing it, but you also get a cellular adaptation, which is basically fat oxidation improves. And that's exactly what you need for going long. So that's a couple of strategies I use for some of my athletes. I don't really follow those protocols too much. I'm just, I just go ride my bike during the day and it incidentally happens so yeah that's probably the best approaches i'd use for trying to go long and so let's say that someone wants to do the divide for example what does a typical training week look like like we, you mentioned someone that could only do 12 hours do you think that is enough or i don't know you've referenced before that 15 is kind of around the mark uh, what's actually realistic when it comes to doing ultras in terms of what's going to get you through it without killing you well again you've got to have expectations that match the reality of what you're actually doing training wise if you're going to go ride if you've only got 12 to 15 hours a week to train and expect to come out and go head to head with the fast guys in saying that you might already be a really fast guy so you might already have the physiology and the training history to be able to possibly do okay but a lot of the times I guess we're talking about the average person here who is doing this for the first time and doesn't have a huge training history, then yeah, you've got to go, well, can I ride straight through for 48 hours without stopping or do I need to stop and sleep? And if I was your coach, I'd probably say, well, 
unless you've done an event where you've ridden straight through first, I wouldn't say try and ride straight through because you might end up putting yourself in the box and never wanting to do one again. So, but you know, you can get away. I know lots of people that have got really good times on that Vic Divide course, like low 40 hours compared to my 38 hour stint that don't train a great deal. They might have a good endurance background, but you know, they're just doing, you know, one or two hours a, a day basically with a couple of long rides here and there. That's interesting. And then on the extreme, uh, I think you've worked with Abdullah before, who's a very good ultra endurance rider. And I, I reckon the I best remember. in the world that guy is if you're stacking up against anybody. Yeah, his, his effort at the Rhino Run was incredible um, and a great story. But I think he had referenced doing maybe 25, 30 hour weeks back to back. Is that right? Yeah, that's he. Like, I don't know. He wasn't working then, so he was out doing. Abdul doesn't train very regularly, so when an event comes, he'll do the hard work for a certain amount of time. I think he's learned that in the past, he started way too early, so he gets. Like a lot of the times, even for when I've got someone on board for something like Peaks Challenge, they want to start six months out and they start going really hard six months out. And by the time we get to, you know, six weeks out, they're kind of done. So I usually now say, you know, if you want to do it properly, a 12 week training block is probably perfect and you've just got to have the time available. And yeah, in the middle of that big tweet, 12 week block, you might do a few weeks that are. 30 hours, probably closer to 40 if you're Abdullah or myself, where it's pretty easy to clock up 30 hours in a week if you're just riding bikes. Yeah, that's kind of, that's an interesting part of coaching is actually knowing if I said to someone, okay, what do you think a big week is? And they might say, oh, 20 hours. And then you see what some people do. It's, it's closer to 40, but it's not regular. It's just sort of that one week. And that's your test week. That's your mental resilience week as well. You've got to learn to eat so you're good for the next ride the next day. You've got to learn to recover and stretch and do everything in between so your, your week goes smoothly. Yeah, I think they're great points that you bring up. Um, while mentally and physically training for 20 or 30 hours a week is tough, it's the bits in between that really make that difference. Like you said, the recovery in between, what you're eating, not even after, but during, so that allows you to back up the next day as well. Like it is during the ride. Like when I go long and I eat enough food, you'd think you get home from a 10-hour ride and you're famished and, you know, I've done a four-hour ride and I get within the last hour, I'm dreaming of what I want to eat and I come up with some crazy conclusions concoctions like you know it's a hot summer's day and i'm dreaming of making an ice cream sandwich because that just sounds good at the time but uh when i go long and i eat enough on the ride i'll get home and i won't even eat anything because i've eaten enough on the ride and i think if you see the way a lot of ultra racers eat and when they train like they won't leave on their ride with a stack of food they'll just go yeah i'm going to stop there and i'm going to have a proper lunch and then that's basically all they'll have till they get home or have a meal at night time so you have your breakfast lunch and dinner with a very small amount of snacks in between and the pace that you're going you uh you're surviving on that it's just you know humans are made for it basically you don't need a huge amount of food once you're moderately trained and you've got good glycogen stores good liver glycogen stores and good fat oxidative capacity. I do want to delve into the nutrition side of it a bit more because I think it's something that people maybe stress about it's not the right word, but when you're doing these long races, fueling properly is an enormous requirement and a part of it. And I think I heard before on your first one, you took like 25 cliff bars, you had two and you were done with them. So it's not really like a traditional road race that's you know, two hours long and you have close to 100 grams of carbs per hour and you can do that with a couple of gels. This is so much different because you can't eat gels for 48 hours straight. So how does nutrition look like in, I know you've touched on it with the training, but racing as well. It is, you've got to practice what you do before you do the event. And yeah, your comment about the cliff bars was I I went through a phase where I bought a bunch of heaps of cliff bars and I was using them in training. I thought, well, these are super good for the race. I can just have, you know, one an hour or whatever. So I took a stack with me, but I'd had them so much in training that I just ate, ate a, two of them. And the next one, I was like, I just can't eat these anymore. So I've learned from that experience to have a good variety of foods with me on the bike. So I guess my go-to these days in an ultra is normal foods. Like I've done another one called Gari Word Wonderland where I made a bunch of 
cheese and Vegemite sandwiches or buy some cheese and bacon rolls or, you know, cinnamon donuts and actually stuck them in a, a vacuum seal, a pack thing to squish them down as small as I possibly could to fit as many as I could in the frame bag. And that I had uh, 24 hours worth of food with me on that ride and it was all vacuum sealed in these tiny little bags. But um, in general, it's, yeah, you, if you can get food along the way, then you got to figure out how far is it to that stop? What can I buy there? At a shop, I'd usually just try and stock up on, you know, liquids while I'm there. So chocolate milks and Gatorades and whatnot. Uh, potato cakes are always good. You can get a few of them to go with lots of salt on them. But I'll bring with me, usually these days, I still use stuff like beta fuel gels, um, the SIS things. Like I'll have them with me because they're, what's in them? 40 grams of carbs. Then I'll have them in, I might bring half a dozen with me because the further into the event you go, when you're getting tired, the less you feel like eating. And if it's a rough event, like eating on the ride while you're riding is actually really hard, especially when you get tired. So you've actually got to force yourself to pull over, eat something and then get going again. Because if you're not eating because it's so rough and you're like, oh, I'll eat eventually when I get to a smooth bit of road and it doesn't happen for an hour and a half. You get yourself in trouble because you start going hypoglycemic and it's kind of the end of it. So I usually start off with real foods as much as I can for a long ride or race and then gravitate towards a lot more simple sugars like just bags of lollies, muesli bars are always there. The beta fuels, I'll bring some sachets to pour into my bottle. So that's 80 grams per bottle. Yeah. And start getting it in that way. And I swear I still haven't got it right i'd love to wear one of those glucose monitors the real time ones in a ride because i swear it would match up with your ups and downs of how you're feeling like you've ridden through the night and it's 6 a.m and you're like i've just got to stop halfway up this hill because i'm actually a bit cross-eyed and you stop and eat something and then you kind of start to come good again and i think it's just because you're running out of blood or well, liver glucose or liver glycogen. So your blood glucose is dropping and you just haven't eaten enough. So because you, you literally got to survive on what you eat. Yeah. So that's basically my approach, but it's, you know, it's different for everybody, but it is something I'd emphasize to anyone going long is it is as much about eating. It's an eating contest. As much as it is a riding contest, it's who can eat the most. I think Abdullah said that word to me. He's like, it's an eating contest, man. You just got to eat. It's like just gross how much you eat. And you've got to force yourself to do it because you don't feel like eating after a while. No, and that's one of those things too. You can't expect to not eat anything or much in training and then go into a yeah. race and be trying to get in you know, a ridiculous amount of food because your, your stomach just won't cope, cope with it. Yeah, and you do have to train the gut. The other main, the other thing I see as well is other riders that like we want to go fast and do it fast. So we are pushing the boundaries of that fat versus carbohydrate oxidation. There's other riders that just chog along at a slow pace in a very much a fat oxidative pace and they're not using a huge, huge amount of glycogen or glucose. And they don't eat a great deal at all. Like you look at someone like Emma Flukes down in Tassie and I see what she takes on her long multi-day rides. And I eat that in about half a day, what she goes through in two days. So yeah, there's a big difference between if you want to push, you need more. But if you're going to take it easy, you don't need a huge amount of food. Yeah. So it's really understanding what your requirements are for what you're trying to get out of the event and the, I guess, the pace that you're riding at as well. Yep. Yeah, that was awesome. And I think would be really helpful to people listening in. I want to go on to an equipment perspective because I think this is a pretty big category in itself. Yeah. For me, these events vary so much. You can have the Vic Divide, for an example, which I think you did on a hardtail or a mountain bike. Is that right? Uh, Vic Divide was a Julie, yep. Oh, Julie, yeah. And then I guess you can have events like the GDT 400 and the Mali Blast, which you can easily do on gravel bikes, you know, even on pr probably 38s and semi-slicks like for the Mali Blast because there's nothing ridiculously rough. So how do people, you know, when they're trying to figure out what bikes, what equipment, what's the process for going through that? I guess myself, what I've normally done is, like, unless it's the first time the event ever been run if it is that situation it's always a bit of an unknown but there's usually a facebook group about the event that there's people posting pictures of their bikes or you find who's done it and go to their instagram accounts and you kind of go through the pointy end of the race through to the slower riders and you see what bikes they're riding and generally the 
front group are, you know, trending towards a faster setup, smaller tyres, you know, maybe not suspension, so the bike's lighter, whereas the slower riders tend to be a bit more loaded up. So generally, I follow the same thing. Like I'll look at who won it last year? What bike did they ride? If I've got any course knowledge, I'll go, well, I reckon I can get away with maybe a hardtail instead of a jewelry. You know, I'm lucky I've got lots of different bikes to choose from. So, but some people have, don't have that choice. So usually it's just, you know, do I stick a bigger tire on? And if that's the option you've got to take, I'd always say run a bigger tire than a smaller tire any day of the week and know how durable some tires are because some of them, are, they look fast, but they're pretty supple. And once you're out there and you've wrecked a tire, you're kind of screwed. Yeah. But yeah, so bike choice sort of comes down to looking at what other people have done in the past and combined with how fast you want to go. Uh, like Vic Divide, I remember thinking the first year I did it, seeing some of the Curve crew do it on their, like their Kevs or their GMX mm-hmm. Pluses, which are full rigid. And I was like, how did they get through that course on that bike? But now they're the bikes I ride. And I, I think with a bigger tire on the GMX Plus, I'd be perfectly happy riding a full rigid bike as opposed to a Julie on that course. Yeah. And then clothing, it's always just looking at what the weather is and like I knowing what nicks, like everyone, the biggest question I always get or the statement rather than question is like, how does your ass cope with riding for that long? (laughs) And if you find the right set of nicks, I just never have a problem. Like good chamois cream, good Mm -hmm. set of nicks. And I just, my ass is not, is not the weakest link in the whole thing. Like my hands get worse than my bum does most of the time. Yeah, so clothing just comes down to, and that's where training's important, like riding in the cold and the wet, knowing that having the right layer system and knowing that your jacket works or ultras, I'll always run a rain jacket that has a hood on it and not just your normal road racing one with a collar because keeping the rain off your head if it's cold and wet is a lifesaver. So just small things like that you learn as you know with experience equipment wise what else is there that's really about it lights and stuff are kind of personal preference but that's um dyno hubs versus battery powered lights yeah it just all depends what you've got and and how long it is really one of the the biggest things for me is especially like using again big divide as an example of being 40 50 hours is how you're keeping these things running for that long you know what what are you bringing in order to be able to keep your lights going for basically two nights yeah well that's training like as i said before i've gone out and ridden through the night so i kind of know how long the light that i own lasts for and you can't actually believe some like if you buy a light and it says on oh, medium it'll last for 15 hours i guarantee if you've got it on the whole time it won't last for 15 hours not that it's dark for 15 hours most nights here in (laughs) winter solstice it might be but yeah like victor vibe was 38 hours i didn't have a dino hub back then i ran a what did i run like a new zealand mob make one called a glowworm light i really liked that one and then i ran a backup exposure light as well i always have a backup light because i've ridden just on a couple of little adventures before when the light didn't work and luckily i had just even just a little headlamp one with AAA batteries in it to get me out of trouble so yeah like a lot of the lights do last through the night some of them you can have an extra battery pack for but there's options out there for people and you know there's places to ask or there's you type it into google and say best battery pack light for bike packing and i can guarantee you there's someone done a youtube video on it yeah and the other thing would be sleeping equipment as well. I guess for all these things, it's almost like a, like a balancing act on, especially if someone like you at, at the front end of the races is how much do I carry so that I know I can cover myself in case things go wrong yeah. and also be light at the same time because obviously you can't carry your bike room full of equipment with you. Yeah, like it's I, I've always been a weight weenie in the past on my road bike. Like I'd get it as light as I possibly could. And but then you get to bike packing races and like my something for like race to the rock setup on the GMX plus with all water and stuff on the bike, it's close to twenty five kilos. Like it's not light anymore. And it does compared to what you used to on a light setup like my hardtail bike that I'd probably ride for for um Vic Divide next time or my or my curve is probably closer to eight and a half kilos without anything on it. 
But um, it feels so crap when you're riding up a 25 kilo climb. Oh, sorry, 20, using a 25 kilo bike up a climb. And the other thing people don't take into account is the gear ratios. So they've got whatever gearing on their bike and they'll go ride up a, a big hill and go, oh, yeah, that gearing was fine to get up a pretty steep hill. But they've done it unloaded. And then you turn up loaded and tired and you're like, yeah, I can't even get up a 10% gradient. So they're off walking because it's too much for them. So, yeah, there's a lot of things to take into account, but I would always bring, you know, if you're worried about a kilo, something weighing a kilo for a dis- decent little sleep setup, you may as well bring it with you because in the long run, it's really not going to make much difference. You know, bivvies, uh, little types of safety measures for sleeping like they don't really keep you warm it's a matter of you just not getting hypothermia they don't do a great deal but if you bring a good sleeping bag with you then yeah you can have a comfortable night's sleep and that can take some practice as well like sleeping everyone watches all these little bike packing clips and stuff of people on instagram and youtube and they go oh it looks so amazing out in the tent or sleeping in a bivy i want to go do it and you get there and do it and you look forward to setting up camp and hopping in your little tent and bivy and you're like this is uncomfortable and gross i'm dirty I feel yuck. It's not as nice as it looks and you've just got to get used to it. Yeah, that's definitely the component that's turning me off doing a bikepacking event at the moment. But well, I that's do the like- good part. If you ride for 18 hours, I can guarantee you, you you'll just go sleep in a ditch and you won't care. So <laughs> that's true. Ride till you ride till you can't ride anymore and you'll definitely sleep. The point that you make um, in terms of weight in your equipment and your setup, I think is really important. I think I've heard Lockie Morton talk about it before. It's like it's worth taking an extra kilo, for example, if it means that you're covered for everything rather than being on a ride and just like praying it doesn't, you know, rain or whatever or, you know, reach a certain condition that you don't have the proper equipment for. So it's better to have the peace of mind and and pack properly than trying to cheat your way through it. Yeah. And there's like for some of those really small things, it's kind of like carrying a snake bandage. It's like a snake bandage and a bivy would be the two things that could save your life basically. And I'd all, I always carry them. Like I've always got a snake bandage on the bikes, especially well in summer, not necessarily winter, but that's the sort of thing where you're out there and you don't think it's going to happen and something really bad does happen and it could save your life. So yeah, don't skimp on the safety equipment. So yeah, that's, that's a good one. pretty important and a no brainer, I think. I agree. Let's move on to the racing or picking an event side of it. If you haven't done an ultra before, what's your advice in terms of getting into it? Because there is a variety of different events. You know, for example, the Dirty Warn is 250 odd Ks, and that can be anywhere between seven and I don't know, probably 14 hours depending on your yeah. ability. And then you've got things like the Vic Divide that's two days and then Rhino Run on it. I think it was that like six or seven days or whatever that was. So there's this huge, massive variance in events. So what's your suggestion for people looking to get into it? The big gripe I actually have with people looking to get into it for the first time is that they look for an event. Like you don't need an event. Make an event yourself. Like if you want to basically – Go map out somewhere that you've never been before or find a route that someone's done. There's a million of them around on bikepacking.com or you go steal one off my Strava or off my ride with GPS for the Otways. Like I've got a million routes there. And you just don't do it by yourself the first time. Just go get a mate or a couple of mates and go, hey, I've got this three-day trip planned out. Do you want to come along? And you sort of pick it based upon what you're all comfortable with. Do you want to just ride 100 Ks a day or do you want to go do 150 or 200? And that then that's the way to get into it, I think. Like become a tour first and actually just do something you want to do with a few friends and then you'll get some confidence and then a, an event or a race is just going to feel like you were doing what you're doing, but there's a bigger group of people. So that's how I would suggest for most people to actually get into it. You don't need an event. It's it's basically an event is just a, an organized route that someone's put up and everyone's doing their grand depart and leaving at the same time. But, you know, if you don't have the confidence to go multi-day, then, yeah, pick something that just goes, all right, I want to ride from sunrise to sunset. And, you know, like our winter solstice ride we do here in the Otway's is 300 Ks on the shortest day of the year. You know, just 
pick something that – and the thing is you've got to plant the seed in your mind and make it come to life before you even get there. So usually when I come up with a cool route for myself, I'll be thinking about it for ages going, oh, if I could link that up and link that up and link that up, that would make a really cool route. And the more you start planning it out and figuring out some resupply points, the more it comes to life and the more excited you want to do to go and do it. So that's how I would say to someone – how to get into this sort of stuff. If you're picking an event, the distance doesn't really matter. Like, you know, could be one day, could be seven days, could be two weeks, but that's just the mentality of going into it. Like if it's not a race, it doesn't really matter how long it is. I actually really love that. And I think it's a really good point. A lot of people probably do need the event as a motivating factor behind needing to train or to look forward to. But the reality is, as you said, you can do it anytime that you want. There's plenty of great places that you can ride to at any point. So I, I actually really like that. I've done plenty of events where it happens to be on the worst weather weekend you've ever seen. And True. You know, when you've got the freedom to choose when you do it on a nice sunny weekend or a long weekend, then you know why would you go through the bad weather when you can just uh, get a little bit more sunshine, maybe? So, very, yeah, very look, good there point. is something there is something nice about the event because you can share stories with other people, and I've gravitated towards that now of not wanting to race these things by myself and being off this out the front solo. Like you see me do lots of events now with a good mate Steve Sullivan because mm-hmm. I always just like having someone to experience it with you know he gets some photos of me i get some photos of him you've got stories afterwards about oh, i remember that big muddy puddle that we got stuck in and it's but when you buy yourself you get to the end and you're like i don't even remember any of it so yeah, yeah. buddy up and, and make it fun rather than it doesn't have to be bad I really love that point as well because I think as much as you can do these events and they're an awesome uh, individual challenge and they will be irrespective of who you ride with, but it does make the experience a hell of a lot better. I know we did an event together at Grand Ridge where you did the 500 and I did the 250, but you had Steve there with you and I had my mate Mitch Lorcan and it does make the experience so much better to be able to share that with people and as you said, you kind of get to look back on the low points you had or the different parts of the course or whatever and you've got someone to share that with as opposed to you've done it yourself well don't really have that same experience yeah and i've learned that choosing or not choosing but depending upon who you go away with you learn a lot from them as well everyone's Mm -hmm. different and steve sullivan who i ride with is he just never really seems to have a low point he's just this constant happy man and he's done a lot of longer stuff before i sort of started too so he was a bit more experienced and i learned a lot from him so if you've got someone that has done a little bit of bikepacking before and you know you can go along with them there's lots of things you can learn along the way from someone else yeah i agree one of the things you touched on before so we probably don't need to go in a whole lot of detail about it again but understanding the requirements of the course i know you mentioned that you pretty much wrecked most of vic divide which may not be possible for everyone and i know that there's face groups you know facebook groups and utilizing the knowledge of other people that have done it but how important do you think that is going if you are doing an event that component of it and having an understanding the different parts of the course and stopping points etc and having that knowledge yeah like i think i in that vic divide you don't need to go ride the whole course but you need to like for a big long race or Vic divide, I would make an Excel spreadsheet that has at least your stop points and the distances between them. So you know that, all right, how much stuff do I need to buy at this shop? Cause I've got a 200 kilometer stretch till the next place. And that's pretty extreme when you're, you're riding that far without a shop. But the, yeah, the more knowledge you've got of the route, the more confident you're going to be going into it. And it can save you like something like Rhino Run. It was, re- I found that really hard. Like Rhino Run was in South Africa and Namibia. And you look up a shop or a town and you've got no idea whether there's a supermarket in that town or not. Whereas in Australia, you kind of know, oh, yeah, I'm riding through Bendigo. I know what to expect. There's a 24 hour Mac is basically every big town. So there's always food. But yeah, just knowing your resupply point knowing where the fast parts of the route are, which you can usually find a Strava segment or something going, oh, yeah, you could, that bit's going to be 100Ks on bitumen. It's only going to take us four hours versus 100Ks of single track somewhere might take you a day. So you've just got to know the segments of the course. And that's the best way to do it is break the course up. 
If you said if, I, if you said to someone we're going to go for a 650 kilometer bike ride, they'll be like, "That's a long way." But if you break that up into six 100 kilometer rides with resupply points along the way, it, your brain can process it a lot better. Yep. You can't sometimes think about it, especially when the route starts to get into the thousands of kilometers of like, "Oh crap, I've got 2,000 kilometers left to ride and I'm already cooked." Which I've been in that situation in Rhino Run and it was too much to handle. But now you've just got to think, "All right, well, where's the next town?" I'm here at this town now. Can I get to the next town? And then you get to the next town and you make another assessment of can I get to the next town? And you just keep chipping along. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point to be really well planned. And there's things to take into consideration about your stop points because if you're going to be going through a small town at two o'clock in the morning, they might not have a servo that's open. So doing that prior planning is going to you know, be really helpful to yeah. avoid issues like that as well. Yeah, like these events, these bike packing events, you know, technically it's self-supported and you're not allowed to book hotels ahead of time. But mm-hmm. once the race starts, you're free to call ahead and say, hey, I'm going to be coming through at two o'clock in the morning. Have you got any rooms? And they usually mm-hmm. say, yeah, we do. We'll just leave a key out for you under the mat, your room number seven. And you get there whenever you do. Sometimes I've said I'm going to get there at, you know, 10 o'clock at night and I don't get there till 2 a.m. And the key's there. I know what's going on. And you go in, you clean yourself up, you have a sleep and then you get going again. So that's, and even towns, like I've called shops that I know are going to be closed and paid for stuff over the phone and they've just left it in a box for me behind their sign and I've wow. picked it up on the way through. So, you, you know, it's all part of the game of being prepared and having their phone numbers written into your queue sheet. I re- put them into my phone. So I just go, yep, yeah, call fish and chip shop in lawn, which I'm going through in, you know, 10 o'clock at night. Call ahead before you even get there. So your stopping time is minimal. You call ahead and say, hey, you're going to be there in 20 minutes. Can I have whatever? And you get there. It's ready to go, you eat it and you're out of there instead of waiting in line to order and, and cook. So there's lots of racing become comes down to efficiency. So there's a lot of things you can do. Like even the McDonald's app is on the phone for when I'm racing um, like Mally Blast. I'll order on the phone, get to the Maccas in Bendigo or whatever it was, and it's there ready to go when I get there. So yeah, when you get to the pointy end, there's lots of uh, little tricks of the trade to stop or reduce stopping time. Yeah, I think that's fantastic in terms of just the amount of detail you've gone into about what you've thought about the planning, how to make things more efficient. The thing for me is, I guess there's going to be points where that's going to change. Like you might have ideal points in mind where you want to stop and get food, but things don't go to plan, whether, I don't know, you might have had a mechanical, so that's pushed something out. How do you, how are you working through this when this happens? Because things like that, when you're under huge amounts of fatigue can become a lot. So, and I know that's the challenge of these ultra endurance events is how do you work through these moments? But yeah, interested to hear that, your thoughts on that. Well, I think luckily I've never really had any major dramas it's left me going oh what do i do now my mentality around that is you be as prepared as you can if something dire happens it takes a lot to kill a human being you'd be surprised and where you've never been anywhere near being you know dead from hunger or dead from dehydration or if you break something walking out of somewhere where you might have to walk for six hours with your bike to get back to a road preparing for some of these crazy long ones i've kind of tried to put that into perspective to make myself feel better about like you can be a little bit pessimistic about it and that can be the reason you don't do it in case something bad's going to happen so i've listened to you know audio books and stuff on some of the long rides about some of the early explorers like ernest shackleton going down to antarctica and they sleep on in wet sleeping bags for six months on pack ice that's breaking up and i'm like if they can survive that i can survive being stuck out in the middle of nowhere for a night and it just kind of makes me go all right you know this is nothing and in the moment when you're doing it or when if it happens you're like yeah this was pretty grim but I can guarantee you that will be a talking point for the rest of your life that you'll tell that story many times. So it's it's very rarely someone ever goes missing. And we've all got satellite trackers. If something really bad happens, the bike packing stuff, you've got that SOS button to hit. If you break your leg or whatever and can't get out, that's what that's for. I you know, you don't want to push it, but there's situations and I've never had to push it, but there's situations where you might have to push it. Yeah, I think that's a great perspective to have as well. The other part that I wanted to talk to you about is your pacing strategy. I mentioned the grand. You love my pacing strategy. I do. Uh, so <laughs> we obviously <laughs> it. It. it was an experience doing the Grand Ridge Grand Slam. So uh, as I said, I did the two feet near the 500. And I think as soon as we hit the first gravel section, it might have been like 
10 Ks in. I've never seen someone attack so hard before. It was like racing a road race against Tadej Pochica. So I must admit, that's turned me off doing one of these events, realizing how hard you race them. So talk to us a bit about well, your strategy, but then I guess how people can pace their own race and, and how they would work that out. Yeah, look, that's at the start of a long race, I've done enough of them now where I'm not scared to just give it a nudge. And usually, you know, the start of the bikepacking races, you're right out in a bit of a procession and there's, you know, there might be 20 people riding as a group and, you know, technically a bikepacking race, you're not really supposed to ride as a group. You're not supposed to draft or anything. So I just kind of like to break things up and, you know, I'm not scared of just giving it a bit of a nudge near the start. A couple of guys might come with me and then you kind of know, all right, this guy wants to race and you kind of figure out who who's up for, you know, the long run basically. But, you know, we went pretty hard in that one, but at the start, but you know, that was the hardest we went for the whole ride, yeah. really. And mm-hmm. I didn't go ridiculously hard. It wasn't going crazy, crazy, but I like to, yeah, I just like to get out on my own. Usually when I picture when I'm racing, racing, I usually picture I'm by myself. So usually I'm trying to get myself into that position where I'm, I'm off the front. I get a bit of a gap and then you can sort of keep that gap. And I'm giving away my race strategies here, but a lot of the races I've done, there's not someone like yourself. Like I could go out and ride for the first 20 minutes of once we hit the gravel section at, you know, 280 watts and I'm not really puffing, but a lot of the other riders don't have that high sort of physiology and that's in their red zone sort of thing. So they'll just back off and let me go. But I'm scared for the day when I get to the point where I've got someone like yourself or, you know, Connor Sens who has the time on the GDT 400 or people like that where I'm like, I'm going to be the one going, I don't want to be going this hard. Um, And that will happen at some point. Like a lot of the bike pack people sort of look at me and go, yeah, you're amazing. But I... And how for fuck how fast I go, but I know if some of the NRS riders, like our national level riders, start getting into this stuff, and Connor Sens is the only one I really know that's just had a full crack at it here in Australia. But if you go to the US, there's you know mm. there's Lockie Morton and all these guys who are I would be hanging on for dear life at their sort of just tempo pace, I would assume. So I'm always kind of overshadowed in my mind by how fast they go. I'm just lucky they're not there in the races I've done. Yeah, and it's super interesting too, and. I mean, looking at, I think Alex Howes, Ted King, and a few of those guys did the recent from Cactus to Divide. To it divide. Um, and they didn't, like, they weren't the winners of it. So I think no. uh, I was actually, yeah, like Ted King, Alex Howes were there. I don't know if they were there to race it, but yeah. that, yeah, it's not, it doesn't come down to physiology. Those, no. once they're that long, it is not about who's got the highest FTP. Um, it is about who is the most mental, mentally resilient person who's sleeping the least, who mm-hmm. can not stop the most. Yeah, it really is that. It is not about who's got the highest VO2 max and best FTP. Mm-hmm. Like on that, actually, I, I like you sort of talking about a pacing strategy for people who want to get into this stuff. And I guess they think, oh, I'm going to be so tired by the end of it. But what I'd call the fatigue profile for these really long events, and if you put it into perspective of someone, if you go for a four-hour ride, you sort of go out and ride it, you know, your zone two and you come home a certain amount of tiredness. You feel fresh at the start. You sort of get tired towards the end. So if you've got a a chart, kind of your your fatigue sort of drops slowly, 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 and then it, it never really just falls off the face of a cliff and actually, you know, goes to zero. If uh, it fresh is 100 and then you, you never get to zero, it kind of just drops to 60% and then it starts feeling hard. And when you do an ultra, I've found that, it kind of, yes, you fatigue over the first eight or 12 hours, but then it never gets any worse as long as you're eating. So yeah, you, everyone's scared of that unknown of beyond 12 hours or so. And how, if it, you know, if you follow the trajectory of your fatigue for the first 12 hours after 24, you're going to be dead sort of thing, but it doesn't happen. It actually, you start switching over to using more fat and preference to carbohydrate. If you, you know, if you condition to it, you start feeling this sort of high and this flow state of just, be in a really good tempo where you can like, oh, I'm doing good numbers like watts wise and actually it feels really easy. And that comes and goes. But yeah, that fatigue profile, I think a lot of people don't understand that you get to a point and it doesn't actually get any worse. And then you start dealing with the mental things of like, oh, now I'm actually mentally tired. It's not my legs. And then the sun comes back up and you're good again. So yeah, it's quite interesting, but that is a big thing I try to push to new people is like, you'll get tired, but then you'll get to a point and it won't get any worse. Yeah. 
And is it, uh, I know, obviously you most likely have a power meter on your bike. Is it for you just purely riding to feel as opposed to any power numbers of any sort? Yeah, after a while. Like yep. after that sort of 12-hour mark, I generally find that it feels like I'm doing decent watts, but I'll look down and then all of a sudden I'm going, oh, I'm only doing 200 watts. It feels like yep. I'm doing 300 so I nearly these days want to not run a power meter at all because I think it can be a negative feedback where you mm -hmm. want to do more, but it's just not coming out. Like you can't yeah. do that power output. I often run heart rate because that I think is a good limiter at the start at least to go, hey, set a heart rate limit. And for me, it's kind of top of zone two, 150 beats a minute. Don't mm -hmm. go over that because that's sort of saying you're putting a rev limiter on it and you will be better on the latter part of the event if you can learn to not spike it too much but yeah power meter is handy it's kind of fun to look at it later on but i've kind of found over time that it really just gets in the way to be honest once you're fatigued you never ride at threshold again after the first 12 hours 15 hours you can't just ride up a hill at threshold even if you wanted to you just kind of stuck it all day pace which for me tends to be somewhere between 70 and 75 percent like if i'm riding up a long climb like the best numbers i've got is probably 75 percent of ftp but i could do mm -hmm. that for ages that's really good insight and i think using your heart rate as a key measurement is a really good one and well metric is is really smart the other thing I wanted to ask you is that uh, we were talking about your fatigue levels and when you're crossing over to these races that are like close to 40 hours, sleep usually is something that comes into it. Where are you finding that balance of pushing yourself for as long as you can to it's smarter for me to stop and sleep knowing that that's more beneficial you know, in your performance in the latter half of the race? Yeah, I think this is this is very different for everybody, but I'm I was never that scared of riding straight through the night. I've done it a million times, well not a million times, but I've people go out booze up all night and then come home at, you know, when the sun comes up. I'm like if you can get through that when you're drunk, then you can do it while you're sober riding a bike. But you've just got to know that you go through little phases of ups and downs. You just got to know how to use caffeine wisely at the right points. And sometimes mm -hmm. I just get through the night and I don't even use caffeine. I find in the off-road events that when you've got when you, your attention has to be turned on to what's coming up all the time you're dodging potholes tree roots whatever on roads i never get tired doing it but as soon as i've had a couple of sections of bitumen in the middle of the night or early morning and i'm just riding the bitumen i'll start getting really sleepy so if you do have to focus on in the off-road events on the terrain i find that keeps me awake like i don't know how they do the ram or something for trans america where they ride through the night on bitumen i think i would fall asleep but yeah in my experience the off-road stuff i don't have the same problem but sure. sleep wise you know i've ridden through two nights straight mally blast and didn't sleep at all and i wasn't tired i was pretty cooked towards the end of that getting back to Torquay but that was a thousand k's in and 50 hours and I'd been off the bike for 20 minutes to have a, a little close my eyes and that was it but yeah once it's longer than that and you're going to do multi-day stuff you have to start sleeping from night one otherwise you just never really recover from it so generally most bike pack races four hours is fine like you ride as long as you can you sleep when you need to, you know, midnight, 2 a.m., you might make it to, you sleep till the sun comes up and then you go. Okay. So, yeah, four hours is the general kind of like you can survive on four hours. Yeah, but I tend to ride faster and sleep a bit more in some of the events I've done. Like I'll mm -hmm. sleep six hours, but I didn't succeed in those events, so maybe I'm I'm doing something wrong. You mentioned the Rhino Run, and it's, it's great to know that someone, and with all your experience in terms of coaching, and you've done a number of these events now, it doesn't always, it's not always successful. So I guess what did you learn from that event, and is it something that now you want to go back and, and conquer like uh, or is there another event that you're eyeing off that's similar to kind of prove it to yourself that you can do it yeah well that was a big eye opener i've done a couple of long long ones now where i you know race from the rock i think i made it five or six days in in probably the worst weather conditions i've ever seen in my life and that was kind of a strategic pull out and then rhino run i just wasn't having a good time and i think i'd gone into it without the right mentality of i'm just i just got to get to the end at the best pace i can sustain which doesn't have to be a hard pace like i always think still think about racing and i want to race but as we've said this is about 
about the journey and failing it a couple failing a couple of them has been a big eye opener in now I'm mentally preparing before an event and having the doing it for the right reason. I'm not just there to go to prove that I'm faster than everybody else, which might have been kind of a mentality a bit than in the first two. The next one is more about me and myself showing that I can get through a a, a grand tour, like a two thousand plus kilometer event and make it to the finish line in you know, I guess my style, I suppose. So yeah, failing, you learn a lot from, I think it's, but it's the mental thing. Like physically in both of those races, I was still fine. Mm -hmm. I just got in this bad negative mental loop where I just couldn't turn it off. And, you know, I had some out points and I took them and I've learned now that I have more regret in that than most things I've done in life, to be honest. So it's, you know, failing. So, you know, you've got to take the ups with the downs. It's it's kind of the larger scale of the ups and downs. I had the mm-hmm. downs. I'd like to have the ups next time. So is there a, a big grand tour that you're eyeing off next? Yeah, I've got well, tour divides always on the cards. I just want to go ride that route. It's kind of the, the Garden of Eden of bikepacking. It just looks mm-hmm. amazing and so many people do it. So there is a bit of a plan for that next year. Me and Jimmy Ashby, a good mate and a fellow Curve ambassador, uh, that kid's ridden around the world at the age of 18 and I've got a lot to learn from him. I've got a lot to learn from like a bike tourer perspective when you're not in a hurry and I've always been a racer where I'm always in a hurry. So I kind of want to hang out with him and just learn how he just goes, no, man, just slow down and we'll stop here and have a beer and just chill. And I think that is what I need to take into some of these longer events where I'm not, I don't have this anxiety of like quick eat, drink, get back on bike, go. It's kind of like just unwind and chill. So I need that, I think, to be better at going fast basically for long Mm -hmm. distances. But yeah, Two would have I. There's a couple of good ones. Mum kind of thinking about Race to the Rock this year as a bit of a trial run. But, yeah, there's a couple of shorter ones. I wouldn't mind doing GDT 400. I've never done that one. And that's near home. There's another cool one, Kanu Rally, which is about a 1,000 Ks in on the Morton Trail in uh, at awesome. Adelaide here. Yeah, so they're up and I wouldn't mind. I'm kind of thinking about them at the moment. Sounds uh, like a pretty jam-packed calendar. Um, well, that's the problem. They're all on at the same time. So you've kind of <laughs> yeah. got to pick pick and choose which one you want to do so mm. yeah i've got to commit to one of those soon i think rather than trying to figure it out closer to september time yeah lastly i just want to get your top three tips for someone wanting to get into ultra endurance events yeah like i think i've already been over my top three tips i've said mm-hmm. the first one is probably you don't have to have an event to make an event do your own event make something up and just go bike packing and that's how most people get into it Mm -hmm. It's kind of fun going out and buying all the equipment that you need and buying some bike bags and stuff like that and just get the hang of it. First, go do an overnight and near home. You don't have to ride far. Just ride to a pub somewhere out in the bush and ride home again the next day. That's an event. And then go, oh, yeah, I did that. And then pick what event you want to do based upon what you're comfortable with. Might be ride through the night and then the first one might be just an all day and then the next one might be, all right, now I'm going to try and ride through the night and finish in the morning. Number two for someone new getting into it is, oh, I knew I was going to have trouble with these three things. What else is it going to be? Like don't, we, yeah, don't think about it as a race. Think yep, about it right. as a journey and an adventure and document it. Like getting out there, like it's so good seeing people with their, I, and I haven't been able to force myself to do it, but go out with a GoPro or go out and like make a little mini documentary of what you're doing. I kind of do it with my Instagram stories and try and bring people along. And I get so much really good feedback from people saying, oh, when are you going on your next adventure? I want to see some more stories. And to be honest, I hate social media and I always feel like a Muppet when I'm doing it because I feel like I'm showboating that I'm out doing stuff. But people live vicariously through other people's things. And if you can Mm -hmm. inspire someone else to go and do it by showing that you're having a good time or a bad time or you made it through a bit of turmoil, then it makes people want to go experience it as well. Agree. Third one would be getting into it. Yeah, I don't know. It's it's fun buying all the equipment. Go buy all the equipment. <laughs> Jump on the commuter cycles website and go crazy and buy a bunch of stuff. I've got so much equipment that I've just tried and tested and gone, oh, I kind of like that for this reason, but I don't like it for that reason. Mm-hmm. And I buy something else. And now I've got way too much stuff and probably need to have a garage sale. But, you know, if you're into that side of things, it's, it's kind of fun having the right piece of equipment for the right conditions, basically. Cool. That's a good one. 
oh, I don't have to go on the community cycles. I can just wait for you to have a garage sale and then uh, I can get yeah, myself set up. Put it up. Awesome, mate. Well, thank you so much. I found it very valuable and I'm sure a lot of people will too. You said it's something that is is growing in popularity. So hearing your experience, I think, makes it that little bit easier for people trying to get into it. So thanks heaps for your time. Thanks, mate. I'll put you on the spot here now. And which which long one are you going to do next? You've been talking about it. I want to hear what long one you're doing. <laughs> I'm pretty sure uh, it doesn't really work when I say I'm pretty sure I've committed to. But GDT 400 is one that I'm definitely eyeing off. It's yeah. It's close to my place. Uh, it goes through Creswick and, and Ballarat and a lot of the areas that I already ride. So I think that's uh, a good first step. So maybe you've heard it here first and I'll commit to doing that one. Good. As you said, don't, well, as I've said, don't think about it as a race. I know there's a mental barrier for you. Just get out and go ride through the night. Don't picture you're going to be doing it solo. Picture you might be just hanging out with me the whole time and having That'd a great time. I'd enjoy that. <laughs> I can film you when you're pushing your bike up some of those crappy little goldfields tracks. <laughs> well, now that you've mentioned the importance of gearing and testing that stuff out, it'll definitely give me something to work on over the next couple of weekends. So I appreciate all the advice. Good. Thanks for the chat, mate. All right, mate. Take care. Chat to you soon. Bye.